Oh, look, Watsi wrote a nice apology, then the very next day, they said the new OGL 1.2, quote, specifically includes the word irrevocable. Sounds like they're compromising, right? Why don't we just listen to an actual contract lawyer in the gaming industry? And finally, they're saying it is irrevocable. However, they changed the meaning of irrevocable. What they've said here now is that it's irrevocable with regard to specific content. So if you draft it and publish an adventure and 1.2 is revoked on Saturday, that adventure you released under 1.2 is safe, but you can't use 1.2 again because it's been revoked. Wow. It's so stupid. <laughs> Well, many thanks to the gaming lawyers out there like Noah Downs, who just clarified that upsetting attempt to deceive the community right after an apology and a new promise to be transparent. I personally found this pretty heartbreaking and demotivating, so I asked this community for video ideas, and let's start with the idea from my wife, Grace World Destroyer. <clears throat> What's he? Stop being a bummer. But really, thank you and the hundreds of folks who shared ideas and are liking and commenting on these non-D&D videos because this is where we learn how to have more fun playing RPGs together. And another top comment asked for more indie RPG stuff. So I'm going to share my first non-OGL yet also D&D-like indie RPG that was specifically designed to help 5e players and game masters have fun with some old school D&D concepts or even take rules and ideas from this game and use them in 5e. You can even use this system to play any low-level 5e modules you already own, so I think it's the perfect stepping stone for folks who, like I did, want to ease their way away from D&D. For me, reading this book is what gave me the confidence to finally dig into the Dungeon Crawl Classics core rulebook a while back, and basically, I'm hoping you'll like the ideas in here, and then love the ideas in DCC like I do. I was holding that upside down. <clears throat> but this game is Five Torches Deep, an easy-to-read, D20, class-based fantasy RPG that blends the familiar world of 5e with the old-school revival, or OSR. It's a top-level bestseller on DriveThruRPG, affiliate link below, written by Ben and Jessica Dutter, with consultation from Ben Milton, aka Questing Beast, on YouTube, who also consulted on the Skate Wizards RPG. I'm seeing a pattern here. Five Torches Deep begins with a complete overview, explaining how this game is based on 5e's core rules with some key old-school principles and simplifications. Like, danger is real, because the characters are not superheroes, at least at level 1. Cunning over crunch means the players are expected to problem-solve with their own creativity rather than hyper-specific character abilities, and one I really like, no dump stats, because even though it has the same six ability scores as 5e, every ability score actually serves an important purpose in FTD. And between each chapter, there's really awesome full-page illustrations like this. Character creation is simplified because, like in most old-school games, we have only the most iconic fantasy races. Humans, dwarves, elves, and halflings. Think Lord of the Rings. And like some old-school games, human characters can choose to be any class, while other races have prerequisite ability scores similar to how 5e multiclassing works to become certain classes. So you would choose your race, then determine your ability scores based on that race, then choose a class based on those scores, or just choose whatever class you want. Remember, you can homebrew this game too. But what I really like about the classes in FTD and DCC is that each one takes the coolest and most iconic features of related D&D classes and puts them into one now super distinct and super thematic class. Unlike in 5e, where some classes are already pretty similar, Cleric, Paladin, and Warlock, and then their subclasses make the character types even more similar. In other words, the classes of Five Torches Deep will sound a lot like the 1 D&D class groupings. Check it out. There are four classes. Warrior, Thief, Zealot, and Mage. Then each class has three archetypes, basically subclasses, and the warrior archetypes are the Barbarian, Fighter, and Ranger. Thief archetypes are Assassin, Bard, and Rogue. Zealot archetypes are Cleric, Druid, and Paladin. And Mage archetypes are Sorcerer, Warlock, and Wizard. So every 5e character class is still represented, 
Technically, Monk is replaced with Assassin, but these class ideas don't get watered down into overlapping subclass abilities, and I like that about old school games. If we look at the Warrior class page, first of all, it's all on a single page. <laughs> That's great, and the description is really short. You are quick, strong, and militant. Combat is your specialty, and you're able to deal and sustain more damage than any other. Flavorful, evocative, that's all the lore we really need when we're already familiar with these fantasy tropes. However, one complaint about this game is that the presentation of some class features is a little too minimal for my taste. If we look at the Thief Assassin, for example, one feature you could choose is Craft Custom Poison. With no other information on what that poison is like, how long it takes to craft, nothing. Overall, it's not that bad because I'd always rather have fewer rules to memorize than more rules to memorize. Some equipment has been simplified, like armor. They're just heavy armor, light armor, shield, and a nun, where each type can just be flavored however you want, exactly like how the shield is already treated in 5e. Weapon types should be familiar. You have melee, ranged, simple, and martial, but they reveal the easy mechanics behind the weapons as well. Simple weapons used with one hand deal 1d6 damage. Simple two-handed weapons do 1d8. Dual wielding simple one-handed weapons does 2d6, but take the higher roll for damage. Then martial weapons just raise those dice to a d10 and a d12. And there are a bunch of example weapons listed in here as well. But on this page, we get into some of the interesting applications of ability scores. Like, a PC can only equip and use magic items equal in number to their charisma modifier, minimum one. And each PC has supply equal to their intelligence score. This is how much resupply the PC brought and represents their ability to plan ahead with what they needed to bring. This is neat, but then you have five supply equals one load, and a load is anything that's equal to about five pounds, so you might as well just be tracking pounds. Maybe I'm not getting it, but I'm also a weirdo who actually kind of likes tracking every single arrow my character has, and if I'm not going to track individual items, I'd rather just be reasonable about what a character can or cannot physically carry around. All that said, a modular little rule system that I do really like is the durability and sundering rules for armor and weapons. This partially inspired my homebrew 5e rules for weapon quality a while back. Basically, each piece of equipment has a durability number from 1 to 5, depending on the material, and rolling a crit fail for a weapon attack or taking a critical hit for armor reduces its durability number by one, and at zero, it breaks. And there's a fun rule for shields, where you can have the shield take durability damage rather than you taking damage. Of course, then there are some equally simple and fun rules for repairing an item's durability, as well as crafting new items with a series of skill checks. And it's great. I really like games where you have to maintain your equipment as long as that maintenance doesn't get in the way of the rest of the game and Five Torches Deep handles this really nicely. Now, one core mechanic of Five Torches Deep that's a little different from 5e, but in a nice way, is the breakdown of actions. Most things like attacking and casting spells fall under active actions. I can't decide if I love or hate that name. Movement actions and quick actions, which are like a combo of 5e bonus actions and reactions. The difference is that every PC gets one action, one move, and one quick action every turn. So you can be more flexible, especially with that quick action. And this kind of reminds me of that Pathfinder 3 action economy I've been hearing about. Critical hits in FTD do double damage, and death is interesting. When you drop to zero hit points, you're unconscious, and then you have one minute or by the end of the combat, whichever is later, for someone to stabilize you before you die. So it's not as forgiving as 5e death saves, where PCs usually stabilize automatically but giving your companions a full minute to reach you makes it pretty likely that one of them will make it. Meaning, death is mostly still avoidable. However, after you're stabilized, you roll 1d20 on the injury table. Not one. Turns out you're actually dead anyway. 2 to 7, you lose 1d6 points from an ability score. 8 to 13, lose a body part of the DM's choice. 14 to 19, disadvantage on all checks until you rest or nat 20, you instantly heal 1d8 hit points. Full range of experiences here, but you do not want to lose all your hit points in a fight. A PC heals one hit point per level per night of safe rest. This excludes rest in a dungeon or in hostile wilderness. 
a PC heals one hit point per night of unsafe rest, such as when in a dungeon. For example, a level 4 PC would heal 4 HP in a night of safe rest, or 1 HP in a dungeon. And I like this slow healing because it encourages the party to return to town or their stronghold somewhere, maybe hang out in a tavern, and just engage in the world beyond slaying monster after monster after monster. Now, with this concept of lethality being the main hurdle, I think, for playing an old school game with a group of diehard, actually diehard is definitely not the right term, let's say dedicated 5e players, I have one straightforward way to broach this concept of lethality. That is, the game does not inherently have a higher level of lethality, it has a higher level of risk. In a minute, we'll see that it also has henchmen or retainers that you can throw in harm's way before your own characters, but really this risk exemplifies the necessity for players to show their cunning over crunch, if you remember that principle from the beginning. They need to problem solve, not just dive into harm's way. But more importantly, the game master must absolutely be fair and clear in how they present information. I've heard or read way too many stories where a player just asks what they see around them and the DM calls for a perception check. You do not need to roll dice there, just tell them what the character sees. I like this line from Five Torches Deep about traps. The GM must forewarn traps through narrative cues, such as already sprung traps from previous parties, an indication that the trap is there, or some other in-game fictional descriptor that allows the players to know when danger is afoot. Once aware of that danger, sure, your players can maintain a carefree 5e playstyle and it would make their character even more brave and heroic in this context, but they're just more likely to collect some battle scars over the course of their adventures. Knowing that, the two built-in mechanics to help the party avoid risk in old school games are morale and retainers. Morale checks are where you roll to determine whether or not a monster or a group of monsters should run away. As we just discussed, fighting to the death is not ideal for anyone, so Five Torches Deep recommends morale checks as a wisdom check at the beginning of a battle, after the first combatant is killed, or when the leader is killed, or if the tide of the battle is just obvious. As usual, it's up to the GM to decide, based on the type of monster, which of those morale checks, if any, makes sense to use during a given combat encounter. Then retainers are paid mercenaries who can fight alongside or on the front lines to help the player characters, but it's also recommended to use morale checks for retainers if the party asks them to do something particularly risky, also depending on how much they're being paid to do it. It's a fun element of the game that doesn't usually come up in 5e. Speaking of payment, this game is written to use gold as experience points. Gold must be captured and safely stored somewhere to count as XP, and this is a direct motivating factor for getting your player characters out in the world and down in dungeons looking for gold so they can become more powerful. Traveling to those dungeons feels more realistic than 5e because, as written, unencumbered PCs can comfortably travel 10 plus strength mod miles per day. Trust me, whatever 5e says, you cannot comfortably walk 24 miles in a day. I tried, it's on YouTube, watch it later. But spellcasting is probably the most different part about Five Torches Deep when compared to 5e D&D. And for me, I think reading this chapter and seeing how it's fun, but it still pales in comparison to the Dungeon Crawl Classics magic system, is what made me decide I was ready for DCC so let's take a quick look. There are spell levels, like 5e, and higher level characters get higher level spells. There's also rites, which are the same thing as 5e ritual casting, but they take an hour instead of 10 minutes, and there's still concentration. A key difference is that all spells require a check. Just like making an attack with a weapon technically requires a check, we just call it an attack roll. If you succeed on that spell check, hooray, it works. If you fail the spell check, a magical mishap can occur, and there's a d20 table of goofy things and a couple damaging things that can happen. The thing is, DCC, holding it right this time, also does this, and it does it no less than 1,000 times better. For real, every spell in DCC is a giant random table, so you're not expected to ever memorize any spell effects. And if you succeed on that check, higher levels of success make the spell more and more powerful. If you fail, wild things can happen and each spell has its own set of flavorful mishaps. You're gonna love it when we get to that video. 
I mean, well, maybe some people will absolutely hate it, but I love it, and I have good ideas to adapt it to different playstyles depending on what you'd like. You'll see. Then, Five Torches Deep has some incredibly insightful tables breaking down how to create and customize your own monsters, which, as I've said, could be used in any 5e game or pretty much any d20 fantasy game. And a random dungeon map generator using a Rubik's Cube. I haven't taken the time yet to try that out, but it seems like a lot of fun to play around with. So if any of that sounds fun to you, please like this video and totally share it with your fellow players to get them interested in playing or maybe even running a game like this. Then check out this cool video about other games to look into, consider subscribing or joining my Patreon to get a bunch of low-level 5e modules, and just support this community in an awesome way. Thank you for your support, and keep building.